microphone that belongs to this man here. Boom! Right. Mads Peter Iverson, you are now live for the world to see you on YouTube. How are you, my very, very good friend? I'm good, I'm good, thank you. The weather is nice and I'm sitting in here working, so yeah. <laughs> All right, awesome. Um, right, I'm just checking now because if that my phone goes off like that, that means it's an emergency and I have to check it. But that's my boss man just telling me that everything is perfectly fine. Tony, just confirm, make sure you can hear Mads and everything, please. I've got Mads's microphone turned up to the max. And to me, he's coming through very loud and very clear. Mads, it's yeah. great, great, great to meet you. I've been a fan of yours ever since you started your YouTube channel. Must have been, what, two years ago? It's actually three and a half years by now. Oh, I can never get enough of a good thing. No, it's uh, time flies. <laughs> three and a half years. Yeah. Have you enjoyed it? Uh, yeah, of course. I, mean, I, I love what I do. Uh, of course, it comes with some frustrations, but, but overall, absolutely love it. I wouldn't trade it for anything. Well, look, I've written down some... Um, some numbers here in case anybody doesn't know I'm sure everybody out there tonight is a massive follower of yours if not they ought to be you have on your YouTube channel YouTube channel 68.5 thousand subs and that goes out quite, quite goes up quite considerably every day 68.5 thousand subs awesome your Facebook 7,900 followers which is pretty damn good as well but this is the best bit instagram instagram bearing in mind i've got something like i don't know 17,000 followers and i'm pretty buzzed about that you've got 376,000 followers i mean come yeah. on that's just taking the mic yeah it's been crazy the past year it's just completely exploded uh so yeah it's a uh, I, I don't know what triggered it, if I'm in some kind of like, you know, positive enforcement loop where because I have so many followers by now that I get the engagement that makes Instagram promote my photos more so I get a bigger reach, something like that, I guess, and then in combination with the photos that I decide to post. I like how you're making an excuse for having 376,000 subscribers. I think that's brilliant. But just it's the... because I honestly don't know. <laughs> right, listen, listen, listen. Just for the record, just for the record, it's just off, right? It's just off the combination of Thomas Heaton, Nick Page, and Adam Gibbs combined. I checked those three, and they've all got very, very, without stating the obvious, Thomas Heaton, without stating the obvious, Nick Page, and Adam Gibbs, all three of them, whom I admire very, very much, by the way. They've all got massive, massive Instagram accounts, and collectively, yours just nearly beats them. It's just slightly under. I was annoyed when I added them up, but I thought, oh my God, what an achievement that is. That is excellent. Thank oh. you. I also push Instagram more than they do, I think. Uh, there, there seems to be a bit of an... Yeah, people are a bit tired of Instagram because they don't get the reach uh, okay. that they deserve. And I completely understand why you can get tired of it. Um, I... Yeah, Instagram is Instagram. I definitely uh, consider that my YouTube subscribers uh, are... It, it's way more uh, beneficial with the YouTube uh, when it comes to the entrepreneurship of mm -hmm. landscape photography and having it as a business than Instagram is. I, I tell you what I like about your YouTube channel as well is that you've resisted going down the clickbait route. Yes, we all still try a little bit, but um, yeah, I don't... I'm not a massive fan when somebody does it on every, every video. You know where I'm going with this. And you're not like that at all. You've just basically allowed your channel to grow in a very, very natural way. It, yeah, it, it's just such a hard line to walk uh, and, and balance. Because on one hand, if you just make generic titles, I, I, I have stats that prove <clears throat> that people don't click my videos. But if I do make titles that stands out a little bit, gets a little bit more like, you know, emphasis on attention, 
with the caps lock and capital letters and, and those things, it does work. But what I've found that works the most is just a combination of luck and hitting the right title or the right theme of the video at the right time. So as an example, I've just, I think it's three weeks ago or something like that, I released two videos uh, with, a, with a week in between, one on, on how to focus your camera and one on how to make sharp images. And they just took off in, in a way that my usual videos don't. And <laughs> those videos for me are super easy to make and I can do it, but I don't have a lot of creative satisfaction from making those videos. So that is why I make interviews like you do here, put them up on my channel. They don't get a lot of engagement. I wake up four in the morning to get out and, and take photographs in woodlands. They usually don't get much of interaction either, but that is where I really like, you know, put all my creativity and all my energy and yeah, uh, all my production value goes into those videos. But the, the sad fact is that you also have to make the other videos if you want to grow and if you want to reach new a new audience. Mm, absolutely. But like I say, I think, yeah, it's all about balance, isn't it, really? Mm. It's all about balance. So well, well done to you for resisting going down that route. Because um, I'm sure people aren't silly, but there are photographers who just, or there are, yeah, okay, there are photographers who just do that and... For some unknown reason, you know, they, they, their channel grows because it's the same as me, it's the same as you. We can look back at our stats and we know the videos that do well and they're always the ones with the clickbaity stuff. If it's just, hey, look, this is me out with my camera taking some pictures of some water, you know, under a bridge, then they don't really do very well. Do a bit of clickbaity stuff on them before you know it, your channel starts to grow. So, But when people just do that and nothing but that, oh, it's so frustrating. It frustrates me because... <laughs> I don't care what they do with their channel, but what annoys me is then people have this perception, oh, look, they have 300,000, they have 200,000, they have 150,000 subscribers or whatever. And so people naturally assume they're, they're, the, they're the boss. They're the boss of YouTube. And I just think it's weird. Yeah, well, you know, it, it, it's it's the medium of YouTube. If, if you focus on an audience and you make advanced photography stuff, then it's the advanced photographers who seek you out. It's not the beginners. And there are uh, exponentially more beginner photographers uh, searching for information on YouTube, at least that's my perception. Sure. Then there, and then there are... Uh, expert or advanced photographers seeking information on YouTube. So so it's I'm also at a, at a place right now where I don't seek out videos on gear unless I specifically want that piece of gear or uh, how to do composition unless some photographer comes up with something completely new because it's yeah, <laughs> it, I know all that stuff. So I, I'm not spending my time on it. But obviously, I did that some years ago. Like YouTube is where I learned photography, so obviously there there is always room for for, for those kind of videos. And the fun thing is that every new landscape photographer who makes a new uh, YouTube video, like you know, the, 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 that's just like a set list of thirty to forty different themes videos that probably will do really really good. Hmm. I think um, it, it is a bit of a fairy tale of yours, your channel, because I've heard you say that before, that you've learned your photography through YouTube. So it just goes to show that, you know, anybody can do it. You know, just, just learn and learn and learn, watch and watch and watch, take and take and take, and then just go off and put your own stamp on it and just do your own thing. And before you know it, you're the next Mads Peter Iverson. Simple. <laughs> Let's, let's throw a couple of questions at you because they're already coming through. Re from Raymond Fitzpatrick. Question, if you had to change one thing in the kit bag, what would it be and why? <laughs> oh, I have this. Uh, yeah, so so I guess my, my, my gear, if there's one thing I should change in my gear. Yeah. Yeah. Anything. Um, the only one thing I'm battling a little with right now is my 12 to 24 millimeter lens. Uh, versus maybe getting a 16 to 35 millimeter lens. And that's because the filter system I have to use to my 12 to 24 is one of those big uh, 15 centimeter by 15 centimeter 
filter systems and the glass becomes quite heavy. And if I can just change that to a 16 to 35 millimeter lens instead, then I can use screw on filters on that one too. Uh, so, so that's the only thing I'm like battling with myself, whether or not to get a 16 to 35, but I kind of don't want to miss out on those <laughs> uh, four millimeters in the broad end. So, but yeah, that, that, that's where I'm like, that's the only thing right now. Let me throw a, <laughs> got a quick question for you. Uh, I've, some guy called Nick Page, Nick, I don't know who that guy, Nick Page. Ask Mads. Never heard about him. I've never heard of him. Ask Mads, where is he going to cut his hair? <laughs> <laughs> You know, Nick, I, I'm I'm going for that uh, um, Nicolas Cage uh, look from Conair. So probably when it gets down to the shoulders. <laughs> well, you know what the way your hair's going at the moment. You and Thomas Heaton are gonna you're gonna blend into one. You know that, don't you? Well, I think Thomas <laughs> just just got a haircut. So uh, yeah, but uh, no. I, in all honesty, I planned to do it last week, but uh, I had some really, really good mornings with some mist and some fog, uh, which will come out in future videos. So I, I was just too tired to bother with it. So hopefully this week. <laughs> cool. Uh, Nick Page, by the way, if anybody hasn't seen the video I did with Nick Page, uh, go back on my YouTube channel. It's still there and watch it because uh, he's a, an, another excellent, excellent photographer. Thanks for sticking by or popping by, by the way, Nick. Thank you. Uh, Dave Pierce, favorite location? Favorite location to shoot? That's on my list somewhere, so that saves me asking it. So, Dave Pierce, favorite location to shoot? Haha. <laughs> is, is it like a specific location, or do we talk an area, or an entire country, or? You far away. Anything you want. You okay. Could say, you could say Mars for me. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so so I have this dream photo that I would really, really like to do is to take a spaceship up underneath the rings of Saturn and just hovering there in the top of the clouds and then have the rings going up on, on top uh, of me. That would be awesome. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, if, 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 if we are a little bit more earthbound, um, I, I really, really, really honestly do uh, so much enjoy photographing in Denmark th these days. Um, I love, of course, Iceland. I love the Faroe Islands, Western US, just fantastic. Um, yeah, Outside of Denmark, I really want to do more of Europe. Uh, I have a thing right now for Germany. I really want to return to Britain. Uh, and then I have like a dream trip of like, uh, yeah, cent cent north, north Central, uh, North Mid uh, US with uh, Wyoming Grand Teton National Park and uh, up through, uh, yeah, Columbia River, no, not, not Columbia River Gorge, um, up in Canada. Uh, yeah, over in, 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 in the eastern, western part of Canada. Wow, <laughs> it's late <right> here. <laughs> you know, yeah. you're, pretty, you're pretty much just answering. British Columbia, that you, was the word I was You just answered that question yeah. with everywhere in the world you've been. <laughs> you know, that's all you're doing. <laughs> you've just written a whole list. What about Scotland? Never mind. I know you mentioned the UK, but I know you've done Scotland. I know you've done Glencoe. I know you've done the yeah. Isle of Sky. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I really want to go uh, also to Torridon. Uh, me and Nigel have a, have a workshop planned there for uh, for, the, for this later this year. Okay. I really wanted to go there. I, I kind of planned to go to Britain uh, this year and do some scouting also, but because of all this virus stuff, we obviously can't do that. So uh, yeah, sure. but but yeah, I, I, Britain. I really really want to return to Britain. That that was. I think Britain was the most efficient in regard to getting a lot of photos in a short amount of time that I still am just absolutely in love with. Uh, the, the photos I got out of Britain were, is just, yeah, probably my favorite collection of photos I've ever taken. That says a lot considered how much I've been to Iceland. Mm. Yeah, well, yeah, that speaks volumes. Before we ask any more questions, I've got a few questions to ask. What I should have started the interview by saying, I do apologize, by the way. Mads, where are you right now? Right now, I am in Aarhus in Denmark, which is the largest town in Jutland, the peninsula connected okay. to Germany. And you are Dutch? <laughs> no, I'm Danish. Da right, you're Danish. <laughs> Can you um, speak any other languages apart from Danish and English? <laughs> I, I understand Norwegian. 
Right. Uh, I I was taught German in school, right. and I can probably come by there, but no, <laughs> not not in the way I speak English. That's for sure. <laughs> okay, so in your native tongue, then um, teach me to say hello to everybody. Teach me, because I'm rubbish at this. Let's go for it. Okay, I struggle with so, English, uh, by the way. <laughs> If if we want it in a, in a little bit of like a popish way, you would just say Heisa Elisam. Heisa Elisam. Yeah. Is that that's, good? That's pretty good. What does that mean? <laughs> it just mean hello, everybody. Okay, it wasn't rude then. All right. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's throw another question at you. Keep them coming, by the way, you guys in YouTube land. Block capitals, please. So Tony... Uh, who's in charge of the questions uh, throw them in the comments below so I can uh, throw them at uh, Mads as soon as I possibly can Peter Stewart hi from Manchester if Mads was allowed only one lens to go out with which one would it be it depends on where I am I guess <laughs> but uh, I would probably choose my 24 205 millimeter oh. or or maybe Maybe some kind of super zoom. Not entirely sure. <laughs> what kit? What kit do you use, by the way? Uh, I'm on a Sony A7R three, okay. and then I have my twelve to twenty four, twenty four to hundred and five, and hundred to four hundred. That's like my base basic lenses. I need to get some some sound samples here, so when people say things like Sony, I can go boo boo. <laughs> <laughs> have you always shot Sony? No, I changed to Sony two and a half ish years ago. Ooh, from and why? Canon. Okay, I like yeah. the, so I like the Sony by the way. But um, why? Why did you change? I changed because I wanted something that was a little bit better for night photography, oh, and okay. I was using the five DS. And as good as camera as it is. It, it just lacks in, in regard to dynamic range. It lacks in regard to uh, high ISO performance, even though it's relatively acceptable. If you just do long exposures and Milky Way photography, you, you can easily come by with that one. Um, but yeah, and, and then I, I, I missed the 4K function, which, well, it, it's so old, so it didn't have the 4K function. But uh, yeah, so I had a, a, an all-around camera that I could use also for, for, for vlogging. So it, it was simply a, a question about practicalities and, and yeah, Sony was just the, the most obvious at that time. It is, um, it is a big thing when photographers change their brands. It is a big, big thing, you know, because at the end of the day, if you've invested a lot in your camera body, okay, I know you can sell mm -hmm. it, but they, they tend to devalue so quickly. But it's the lenses. If you built up a good collection of lenses, then that's generally where the problem lies with regards to... Yeah changing kit i'm guessing if all lenses fitted all bodies people would probably change the brands of their camera like they would their underwear does that make sense yeah most likely i would say so <laughs> yeah i mean I'm, I'm a canon fanboy i've always been a canon fanboy i have nothing wrong oh, I, I have no dislikes with anything to do with with canon i've just bought another new canon camera now and um <laughs> I, but I don't know. I don't have anything against any other brands. But the mere thought of changing to another brand now, God, it would have to take some amazing camera to make me do it. Because otherwise, like you say, you know, you've built up all your lenses, everything based around the Canon system. It would just be a nightmare, a nightmare to deal yeah. with. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, nightmare. Th there, there's a few things that I really miss from Canon that I, I think is a su super big problem with my Sony. And that's obviously... Uh, since it's a mirrorless camera, I get a lot of dust spots on my uh, on my sensor, which is super annoying. And uh, just with this camera, I'm I'm not sure if if the hot shoe gets a little bit wet, it comes up with like an error message that Sony have yet to fix through some firmware, and and I I don't know. What, what it will take for them, but I'm shooting quite a lot in wet weather, so it is actually a big handicap for me and, and a big frustration, uh, but it's something I just have to deal with for now. Um, I still have my Canon lenses, so I'm, I'm not saying I'm not switching back at some point, but my Sony lenses were really, really, really expensive, so yeah. <laughs> It's an interesting one, though, isn't it? It's always interesting. Yeah. It always amazes me. There are people out there who do change their Canon 
oh sorry, their, their camera systems quite often. And I often wonder, God, I would just be, I'd like, to me, it'd be like moving a house. And I'm not saying that because I own a thousand Canon lenses. That's not the case at all. You know, I only, only own half a dozen lenses. But at yeah. the end of the day, that's just in itself would just be such a nightmare. Such a yeah. nightmare. For, for me, like, gear is gear. I, I have luckily, uh, I'm not uh, suffering from gas anymore, that <laughs> gear acquisition syndrome. Um, it, it's, it's a tool. And if I need it, I see if I can justify buying it. And if not, there's no reason to do so. I, I haven't bought the A7R 4 And it seems as if, to me at least, that the upgrade is so small that I can't really justify throwing another, I don't know what the price is now, like $4,000 mm. at it. So, so yeah, it's... It doesn't make sense. I'm really, really happy about my A7R 3 It produces fantastic images. What vlogging camera do you use? Uh, the uh, Osmo Pocket, DJI Osmo Pocket. Wow. Yeah, and and I, I combine it with uh, the Sony uh, RX100 Mark 7 so the newest one of their small point-and-shoot cameras. I've just bought a new... I'll, I'm going to do a video on this one. This was my vlogging camera for the past three and a half years. It's my Canon G7X, and it's all mm. it's all broken and all messed up, but it still works. Um, but I've had to retire it because the last video I put out, I realized it was starting to lose focus an awful lot because it's filthy under the lens and I can't do anything with it. So for the first time in three and a half years, I've now bought a new camera as well. And it really, mm. really upsets me because when you get something that just works... I'm not bothered then. I'm not trying to replace it every five minutes. You know, no. gear doesn't really interest me that much. Yeah, yeah. same here. It's just so annoying. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. It's uh, and, and the reason why I got the RX100 Mark Seven, uh, not because it was the newest, it's just like there's a few functions in it that I really like, uh, and also that it has that 24 to 200 millimeter range. Sure. So I can just put it in my pocket when I'm out for a walk and, and if something happens that I at the very least have a 20 megapixel photo of it which is more than sufficient sure. for most circumstances. I mean at the end of the day you know this is what I try and tell people all the time it's not so much about the gear it's about the storytelling and if you can story tell mm. you could story tell with a phone you could story tell with anything you know you don't have yeah. to have you know um, you look at someone like Casey Neistat you know, he's one of, obviously, YouTube's um, premier storytellers. And more often than not, he just goes out with his Samsung phone and that's it. And, you know, yeah, well, not... you can you can just like uh, an example closer to us is Thomas Heaton. Like he's not even upgraded to 4K yet. Uh, no. It's he don't need it. Technically, I don't need it, too. I think it's like two or three percent of, of my subscribers who watch my videos in 4K. It's only a luxury thing. And only because I went rather much down the road of making those like more cinematic sequences in in my um, yeah uh, yeah with my mavic and and, and drone stuff and sure. stuff from from the faroe islands and iceland so but i don't really need it let's throw another question at you then from uh, youtube world uh, dave pierce again dave stop taking over your favorite Location. I've already asked that. I've asked that. I'm like, sorry, Peter Stewart. <laughs> sorry, David. I was giving David some grief there. Peter Stewart. Hi from Manchester. Already done that one. Barry Partington. See, I told you how difficult this is, didn't I? All I've got to do is read questions. Uh, Gary, question. Uh, will you be getting Gavin Hardcastle on so you'll have the full list? Uh, well, Barry, I've asked, I've requested um, to get Gavin on here, but up to press, um, I haven't been successful so we'll just have to wait and see oh dave pierce again dramatic or moody images mads dramatic or moody what would be your preference why not both okay where's that <laughs> shot from behind you by the way i love that picture behind you. that's that's from here from denmark it's uh from my hometown in silkeborg i live in aarhus now but silkeborg is like 40 minutes from here mm -hmm. I was, when I took my teachers, uh, I was in teacher's college. I was running around these forests here when I got my sports education. Mm -hmm. So it's it means so much to me that I can take photos that I really, really love in my own, own neighborhood. 
Well, now you've mentioned that somebody did ask the question along the lines of your education. Jim emailed me in. Jim, Jim, Jim. Could you ask Mads the following question, please? Given you undertook a master's... Ooh, ooh, check this. Given that you undertook a master's in education philosophy... What was the driving educational philosophy? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. What was the driving factor to becoming a full-time photographer as opposed to being a teacher? Best regards, Jim. So while you've mentioned that, yeah, um, I think when I went when I, I went to a teachers' college, I went in there because I'd been a gymnastic coach for many years, and. I kind of just thought that that was what I wanted. I decided not to become an astronomer. Uh, I started in reading uh, physics and astronomy in the university, but there was just too many numbers. <laughs> and even though I still am super fascinated by astronomy and I absolutely love it, I, I, I needed something more visual. Uh, and I didn't at that time, I, I weren't too interested in, in photography or yeah, video or anything like that. So I just, took my teacher's uh, degree and it's a pretty good education in Denmark because it opens up for, for a lot of different things that you can do. Sure. So afterwards, uh, teacher's college, that's a bachelor. I, I went to uh, the university and took my master degree in educational philosophy. And that was mainly for the philosophy part. I had some, it sounds so crazy when I say I have some personal issues that I needed to sort out. I, I wasn't crazy or anything. I just needed to <laughs> figure out uh, some, some some of life's bigger questions in regard to religion and science and yeah, the meaning of life and all, all those things. So I went in there for my own education, not because I actually wanted to use it for anything. So it was more philosophy than it was education. It was just the only... Uh, philosophical master degree I could actually take uh, due to my previous, uh, due to my bachelor. So surely then, you get your qualification, then the next step then is to go into teaching. At what point in that gap there did you decide, hey, I want to make money from being a photographer? How did that happen? Oh, it happened over a year's time because when I was done with my master degree, I wasn't really sure what I wanted. Uh, I could become like a 10th grade teacher here in Denmark. Uh, I couldn't go into educate in high school because I needed a, another subject and I didn't have that. So I actually went to a, a boarding school for grown-ups in the gymnastic world, which right. is a rather famous school here in Denmark. And it just gave me more time to figure out what I wanted. And I was actually hired for that school to do some education down there as a, as a teacher and do some promotion videos for the school and, and, and so forth. And I kind of figured out that I could earn money from photography in that period. And I was doing wedding photography and I was doing video commercial stuff and or all those things that actually gave me uh, money on the table and headshot photography. And it was like in that period that I kind of like, okay, I can do, I can do photography. And I was in, in the direction of doing portrait photography for a long time. I became really good at it, but I just reached a point where I was so tired of depending on, on other people. And I was tired of not being able to be as creative as I wanted to be, which I couldn't do with the kind of portrait photography I was doing. And I kind of slowly started just taking pictures of landscapes. I had been taking pictures of landscapes, but I became more and more interested in it. And when I finally figured out how to make landscape photography that didn't have that crazy HDR, gritty HDR <laughs> style to it, but still make it, you know, pop and dramatic and interesting. Uh, I, I decided to go to, to Iceland, very much inspired by um, F-Stoppers and their first tutorial, landscape photography tutorial. Sure. And I was just blown away up there. Like it was the first time I, I was traveling on my own. I had three weeks up there. The first time I was out in nature on my own. First time I just completely dedicated myself to landscape photography for such a long period. I, I was 
uh, climbing mountains in the middle of the night to photograph the auroras all by myself up in northern Iceland and doing all sorts of, it sounds super crazy, but it was pretty safe. But yeah, it, it, it was just such an existential experience that I kind of knew what I wanted to do for the next many years. At that point, I couldn't earn money from it. So I had to do all the other photography stuff too. I got hired and uh, when I came back home, I did a few jobs, but else I, I got uh, into a photography store and worked there for half a year. And that gave me the push to pursue uh, a freelance career as a photographer uh, and, yeah, just earn money. Uh, like Even though I only earned like $100 a day, uh, that was what I wanted rather than standing in that damn shop all day because that was just, yeah, it sucked the li life out of me. <laughs> Interested uh, on your take with regards to um, portrait photography. Um, I've been shooting portraits for I don't know nearly nearly twenty years now, and uh, mm. I must admit I I do I do like it's 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 a catch twenty two situation. I don't miss them, but no. I, I love the challenge of them. I yeah. love the challenge of them more so. It's it's better when you get somebody who isn't a professional working with a model more often than not. Is a bit can be a bit lifeless. Don't want to sound horrible to all the models I've worked with, but you know when you just ask somebody to do something and they do it perfectly well, you just feel as if you're not maybe having the engagement with them, or you're not creating something that you you would love to create by trying mm. to get somebody who's clueless to do that. Does that make sense? So yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, after a while, yeah, when you yeah kids and stuff like that. Yeah, there are certain times when you get kids running around your studio and you're like, oh my God, <laughs> i got to be careful what I say. Uh, okay, let's yeah. go. Uh, <laughs> let's yeah, go I have a fun story with that because when I go worked in, in that photography store, we had a period where we did baby photography. So the photography session was free, but people came and, and bought the pictures. So yeah. it was about selling the, the prints. Yeah. And... It was fun. It was fun photographing those babies. They were super cute. And, and for the most part, they weren't crying. So there were a few babies who were just like, nope, this is not going to happen. Yeah. But most of them, <clears throat> like that little baby <laughs> smile. And yeah, it, that, that was fun. That was nice. <laughs> Couple more questions. Let's throw some questions at you. Keep the questions coming, guys. Although I'm getting lost now. Uh, how important is processing to your final images, Mads? That's from I Can't Fly 1001. I love that name. How important is processing to your final images, Mads? I think you pretty much covered a, a bit of that just then, but... Yeah, uh, I, I, I would say that um, my final photos are 50-50, uh, in-field and editing. Obviously, uh, they kind of depend on each other. But uh, yeah, I, I'm quite heavy on my processing. I have started to s go towards, not a style, but I prefer not to sit in front of the computer and edit a photo for six hours anymore. Uh, I have other things to do, so I do it less now, but I've also learned how to do it faster and kind of know in what direction I want to go. But when it comes to editing the final photo, I would say like half of it is is the editing that that does the trick mads do you ever use luts on your images thanks john john cusick Mads, no. do you ever use luts on your images no no do you uh, use no luts on your, on your video uh i i i did for a period but color grading in video and me have just never been friends so I just gave up on the entire thing and I just used the uh, standard looks on uh, on video. I set the white balance and I, I try as much to optimize the video settings. But even then, I sometimes, like on sunny days, I just use, shoot with a shutter speed of like one five hundredths of a second. Like yeah. it's it doesn't make much of a difference in the end. What makes the biggest difference for me is that I shoot at 30 frames a second instead of those 24 that everybody promotes. Each time I see something in 24 frames a second, I see it looks as if it lacks to me. Uh, but increasing it to 30 seconds uh, or 30 frames a, a second, I I'm more engaged with it. Sure. It looks more real yeah, per more se. Yeah. It looks as if I'm standing there with them. 
Yeah, sure. I'm. Um, <laughs> this is going to sound a bit bit weird because when I spoke to Nick uh, a couple of weeks ago as well, he's dead against just like you are. He's dead against using LUTs and using presets and stuff like that. Now, I use actions all the time, and I'm going to do a video on on the mm. reasons why I use actions, but probably not for the reason why you and everybody else are thinking right now. I use actions to speed up my workflow. I don't use actions as in. I have a button that I press that makes my landscapes look fantastic because that action, that look, no matter how much money you pay, does not exist. And that's the worst thing that you could do is become dependent on these things. But for my workflow, I use actions all the time, but only to to to, to basically, well, to speed up my workflow, that's it. Yeah. I use shortcuts, keyboard shortcuts. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I'm really sad. I've got a really bad memory, but I pretty much know every shortcut there is in Photoshop. That's really sad, that, isn't it? I'm embarrassed to say that, but yeah, I use them. Oh, oh even in my teaching. I also like, you know, create my own. You know, the, when you create an awesome effect and you, you make like a, yeah. a Gaussian blur layer and so forth, like I just have them uh, for my left hand so I can just like, you know, get them very, very fast instead of having to click through and into filter and then into blur and then Gaussian blur. It's just like click and I'm yeah. there. That's the point I'm making. If you if you do yeah. something repetitively, then I create an action for it all the time. I then even yeah. associate the F numbers on my keyboard with the particular actions. I'm really, that, really that's sad. Good. That's a really good idea. Yeah, that's exactly what I do. Um, yeah. Warp speed. Uh, ever happened that you missed something because of not having a specific prime lens with you on the field blimey hang on so have you ever missed anything because you didn't have a specific prime lens in the field no 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 i i i the only well i have two prime lenses right now that i use uh and and i use them both either for milky way photography or especially for northern lights photography i have my 20 millimeter f14 from yeah. the sigma art one and yeah. then i have the lower 15 millimeter f2 which is quite new i haven't used it as much as i thought i would i i, can, I kind of stick to that 20 millimeter from from sigma and uh, it, it works for almost everything at night so no i i actually i don't think i've missed anything like maybe a specific northern light shot when there's a lot of activity and stuff but that's more to my clumsiness and not because of the gear <laughs> to me prime lenses Prime, lens, prime lenses are there for a specific reason. Yes, if you want to do lots of nighttime stuff and you need a really fast lens, then get that 1.2, get that F2 lens, whatever. But in all of my workings, I don't ever use prime lenses. So when I'm teaching, because I do uh, a lot of teaching of wedding photography, uh, so when I'm mm. teaching students on a Monday morning and, uh, and everybody gets their kit out, there's glunk 85 mil prime lens, glunk 50 mil prime and uh, glunk 24, and you're thinking, right, I'll give you a challenge. I'll give you a challenge. We'll spend one day with a bride and groom on Tuesday, right, or Wednesday, doesn't really matter, as part of the five-day course. You use your prime lenses, and I'll use my one 24 to 105 mil lens. And I almost guarantee you by the end of the day, you'll be like, why on earth have I bought all these lenses? So when you see these photographers that say, you know, oh, every wedding photographer should have this lens and that lens, and, that, and they're all prime lenses. When have you got time to change all these prime lenses on a shoot that happens instantly, now, so quick? It's bizarre. Yeah, Absolutely yeah. Bizarre. For landscape photography, it... it the only benefit you really get is either by night yeah. or admittedly as a rule of thumb the primes are sharper mm -hmm. and have better picture quality mm -hmm. but i'm not going to carry seven prime lenses up to the top of a mountain to take photos <laughs> I, i'm just no not gonna happen like i'm young and strong but i'm not that strong <laughs> and i don't want to kill my back for the next yeah. couple of days so no three lenses uh, at max and and hopefully at some point someone figures out how to make a, let's just say like you know 35 millimeter to 400 millimeter <laughs> a 16 from, to 500 mil <laughs> That'll do yeah me. is it too much to ask for it's like a f8 <laughs> to f11 whatever I, I i don't know like because i i don't need those open apertures i simply just don't use them and yeah. Yeah, for portrait photography, it makes 
a whole lot of sense. I, I, I enjoyed using my primes for portrait photography, mm -hmm. but for landscape photography, it doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> I agree with all of that, by the way. Exactly, exactly right. You know, they are <laughs> sharper. They are better. They, they, they last longer because, in theory, there's no real moving parts. And, you know, you can bounce them about off the walls and off the floors and they'll just last forever. But, like you say, when it comes to practicality, yeah, buy, yeah. A, buy a prime lens if you have a use for a prime lens. And, 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 and also, like, these years, um, because we're getting these high megapixel cameras are coming out, a lot of the zoom lenses, uh, newer designed zoom lenses, they are designed with that in mind. So they are incredibly sharp. Yeah. Obviously not at all focal lengths. Obviously not at all apertures. Because I think that's just physics. They can't get around that. But for the most part, they are more than sufficiently sharp to to get your yeah a, a print like the one here behind me. This is shot at my with my seventy to two hundred f four mm -hmm. uh, from Sony, and it's yeah it's <laughs> yeah I, I don't need uh, more. You see, I, I, I do an experiment in in the studio. I, I have this thing where I keep all my magazines, and I have hundreds of magazines. But that goes back through when we used to advertise a lot in magazines for the studio. Mm. Then we'd always get the magazine sent free gratis. That's part of the deal. And I've yeah. got hundreds and hundreds of magazines there that are still sealed. And I can open up a magazine from let's say seven or eight years ago, and you'll see a fantastic landscape picture. And when you look down at the bottom of all, you know, the cameras and the equipment that they, they use, it was like a Canon 5D. And you think to yourself, that still looks good now. And that still looks fantastic in print. So if you owned a Canon 5D now, it's still going to take the same good picture. And no matter, what yeah. no matter what camera you compare to the Canon 5D, nothing is five times greater. Yes, there are better cameras that handle noise better and so on, but nothing <coughs> five times better. Do you understand what yeah. I mean? It's bizarre, uh, isn't it? Exa exactly. Like when, when <laughs> just my little uh, RX100 Mark IV here, right? Like 24 to 200 millimeter, super sharp lens, which is in it. And that camera is light years ahead of anything that came out like in, in, in the middle zeros. I yeah. remember when my English teacher, when I was in high school, got his new 10 megapixel camera and we were like, Whoa, that's supposed to be really, really good. And, like, I, I, I have been um, uh, to. I've been shooting with my with my drone and standing there there in front of a waterfall, and I really needed like to compress uh, the the scene. So I had to fly the drone away to get that compressed view, and then crop in afterwards. Sure. So so the picture I have there which works really really well is two megapixels but on, on unless i have to like print it two meters tall it's sufficiently fine like as long as you just have a little bit of viewing distance which you always have so you know it's there's so many factors that counts in and yeah many megapixels and um yeah many megapixels and sharp lenses are nice to have but for the most part, they're not necessary to have unless you specifically, you, unless you're a photographer who knows what you're doing and you have a, like a medium format camera and you need to make prints for like 10 meter walls yeah. that has to be really perfectly uh, printed. Then yes, then you can justify it. But for just for me, for <laughs> most of us amateur <laughs> photographers, it makes no sense whatsoever <laughs> to have it, have the gear we have. <laughs> it's just so true. I was I was flashing that at you. I went to uh, I just took a family holiday last year to America, and we spent um, literally two days in New York. And they just had this camera on me, and I thought, I wonder if I could just do a vlog. So I did a street photography vlog with just this camera. So uh, in that vlog, all the stills are from this camera, all the video are from this camera. And you know what? It's no different. It's absolutely no mm. different from the gear I normally use. At the end of the day, you know what? I'm not blowing them up huge like, like well, exactly what you just said. You just don't yeah. need all that gear. I take a picture around with me. When I do talks at camera clubs, I have a, a picture. Obviously, you can't make reference now, but it's a huge, huge picture that I, I take with me. And it's a one of the nicest landscape pictures that I've ever taken. And people look at it and say, oh, that's really, really nice. And then I tell them, it was shot at ISO 8000. And the first thing people do, really? And then they go really close to it 
And Pixel Peep. Oh, yeah, I can see it now. Yeah, you can see it now, but you couldn't see it a minute ago when you were stood just exactly, admiring yeah. the picture. Stop Pixel Peeping. That's a question I was going to ask you, by the way. Do you Pixel Peep? Um, <laughs> yeah, but just, just to make sure that I know how the picture looks, I do it quite a lot when I edit. I, I cannot not do it um, because when I, when I do those uh, hardcore editing, uh, I need to make sure that I don't create any halos or sharpening artifacts or anything like that. Sure. Um, but but besides that, no, for the most part, I don't. I Like you, I shot a, a photo this winter just out of the front window of the bus. And <laughs> the amount of grain in that photo was crazy. But, you know, also the new uh, noise software is just really, really good. And yeah. in the end, the grain wasn't like, you know, ugly or that bad so <laughs> it's it's storytelling i mean we look back at 50 60 year old pictures you know from maybe mm. really important news pictures story story pictures and yeah and maybe even from a newspaper at the end of the day it's the content you're looking at it's the story attached to the picture and not you know in there with a magnifying glass and pixel peeping because yeah. that's just ridiculous i think more people need to know that I've got um... also uh, just just to end, end, end this discussion. Mo many of my f most popular photos are from my two first tours in yep. uh, in Iceland and from my US tour. And I was using a 5D Mark III and a 5D Mark II from Canon back then. This is like 21 megapixels, as far as I remember. Yeah. Uh, do I have to throw out all those photos because they are only? <laughs> 20 megapixels they <laughs> are both popular they're beautiful they print nice so you know, it's... <laughs> that's a point i was making earlier with the reference about the old magazines absolutely yeah. they were brilliant then and they're they're brilliant now um a exactly. couple, couple of questions um from youtube world exploring light i do love how people use names like that how e yeah. <laughs> to be fair i do like this question right so it's probably yassi <laughs> yeah matt pay attention i do like this question how easy is it to get used to the Sony menu systems, because easy. it's not easy. Be honest, because it's they're easy. a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> so what what you do is you get a little bit of experience with the camera and what you use, and then you just use your the the favorite the star menu. Yeah. And then you just add everything you need to that star menu. And for me, I only have like ten things that I need to go in and and change from time to time. So I hardly battle with my Sony system, but yes, admittedly, there is a lot of things <laughs> in that <laughs> menu. And you never touch them, do you? You never touch them. I don't know why they keep adding them. It's so mm. confusing. Um, there's, a, there's a strange one in Nikon cameras that I can never, ever get used to. And one is you go into the you can go into the menu system to change your mm -hmm. ISO. Okay, so you'll change yeah. your ISO for let's say from from 100 to 3200. But then in the menu underneath it says auto ISO on or off. So they're in two separate menus. So in other words, if the menu underneath you set your ISO to auto, then the menu mm -hmm. above you could set it to ISO 1600. Go back in and it's still on auto. You set it to 400, but it's still on auto. It's a separate menu system. I bet all the Nikon people are shouting at me now, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it, it, it's, it's, uh, it sounds weird, but yeah, I've never used Nikon, and each time oh. a, a, a client or a guest brings a, a, a Nikon camera out in the field, I'm, I'm just lost. Like, it, it's so <laughs> different from Sony and Canon. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a hard one. Usually, I do co-guide with someone who knows Nikon cameras, so it's not that big of a deal, but yeah. <laughs> uh, John Cannon asks, did Mads use the Canon lenses on the Sony with the Sony adapter? Uh -huh. Yeah, for, for a short period. In, mm. in, in that period when I, from I got the camera uh, and, and then I slowly got the native lenses, yeah, I, I used the, uh, the adapter. I tried a few different adapters. None of them really worked. Uh, I had to, uh, if I didn't want like really soft edges, I had to crop in quite a lot. Sure. I never used that super duper expensive uh, one. I don't remember the brand, um, but yeah, I tried both Sigma and some some cheaper versions so, also. So when you moved when you moved on to Sony, with everything being Sony, 
Was there much of a difference? In other words, the Sony lens compared to the Canon lens. Sell Sony to me. Sell it to me, man. Sell it to me. <laughs> no. It's uh, in, in the end, what is good with Sony is that it does have that higher dynamic range. It is so much easier to bring up the shadows without bringing up a lot of noise, uh, simply because... I think it has something to do with that ISO invariance uh, sure. built into the to, the to the camera, which my Canon didn't have. So there is quite a lot of noise in my Canon cameras. Have it ever been a big issue looking back at it? No, not really. <laughs> so so, yeah, it it it's good for low light situations for the most part, uh, especially northern lights. But and and then it has the flip screen, which I really, really, really love. It doesn't have a fully articulating screen, which I would love it to have, but at least uh, it has the flip screen and 4K and yeah, all the small practicalities. It's more a question about practicalities than actually image quality. This is a good one. Are you ready for this, Lynette yeah. Stewart? Lynette probably thought I've missed this uh, this comment or this. Actually, it's a comment, it's not a question. Mads is smart and handsome. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Come on, absorb that for a second. Mads, what's your marital status? <laughs> I hey, have a girlfriend. <laughs> you have a girlfriend, so you're not you're not you're not free. Lynette, sorry. I'm not free, no. No. Next time, Lynette, you'll just have to aim that question towards me. <laughs> <laughs> right, Sander, question. What is the best thing you learned from shooting woodland in Denmark? What to do? What to do some over here or want want he wants to do some over here in the Netherlands as well. So question is, what is the best thing you learned from shooting woodland in Denmark? That's the question from Sander. Well, I would say that the best thing I've learned is that it can actually be done. Um, but that's more a question about actually getting out and actually do it and believe that it's possible or get the experience with it that it being possible. It does require of course, you need to do the legwork. So you can't just like look, oh, that's a beautiful composition at Kirkjufell in Iceland, and then go and take that composition. Sure. You have to work for it to get those original compositions. You have to explore, you have to do the legwork, which is a, a fantastic part of the, the landscape photography uh, process. But but yeah, I, I think the best thing I've learned is that it's possible. And the best thing about it is that I admittedly relate more to the photos I take here in Denmark than uh, than when I go abroad. Cool. It's about getting out there, isn't it? Just get out there and take the blooming yeah. pictures. Um, Paul Richards. God, so many questions. Paul Richards, Mads, what drone do you use? I use right now I use the DJI Mavic uh, 2 Pro, it's called. Okay. That's it. There, there isn't another one really, is there? I think most photographers will use that one. Yeah, the, the the new mini seem to be pretty decent, but uh, I'm not sure it, I, I I can justify an upgrade. Cool. If it's a, I don't even think it's an upgrade. It's still 12 megapixels for photography. I think the Mavic 2 Pro is still the best. Yeah, yeah. The thing is, again, they're brilliant, aren't they? Look how small that damn yeah. camera is, and they're mm -hmm. absolutely fantastic. They really are. Yeah. I, I know people that print loads of drone um, drone pictures. They print them and yeah, sell them as well. And why yeah, not? yeah. Mm, and they're only the Mavic Mavic 2, Mavic Pro 2. Uh, Exploring Light asks, uh, have you ever found your photography gear become a hindrance in creating an image while in the field? So have you found your photography gear to become a hindrance in creating an image while in the field? Mm, not becoming a hindrance. I, I found that I, I lacked some practicalities about a camera. Uh, let's just if we just stay with Sony it, it only had the flip screen uh, the use of the flip screen when I'm in horizontal but when I change to vertical it, it's useless so but but besides that no I, not, not, a, not a hindrance I would say I'd love another drink please you want to come and say hello to everybody yeah, thank you okay <laughs> so the wife just popped in you want another drink um, I'm rushing through these questions Steve Foreman could you ask Mads what is his favorite season. What's your favorite season? Ooh, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, I think all of the seasons have something to offer, but 
I have found that it's it's probably that late winter, early spring season that I get the least photos from, dependent on what country I'm in. But but I, I would say that uh, I have really become fond of summer. And autumn for me, I found out that I'm actually not that into those burning red autumn colors by oh, doing right. a lot of autumn photography uh, last autumn. Um, I, there's just I think I prefer the, uh, the 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 colder colors like green and blue. So uh, so yeah, and and I like winter too, but I have just been shooting a lot in winter time and those barren landscapes in Iceland and the Faroe Islands. So I have really come to appreciate summer and just walking around in in a beech forest in Denmark with the sun coming down through it uh, or in a misty morning or foggy morning but generally i i do prefer the the colder greens and to uh, to to autumn so so yeah i i think summer and winter is probably my favorite seasons well let me see if this works and i'll give you my answer one second hey siri what time is sunrise tomorrow <laughs> Just a sec. Sunrise tomorrow will be at 4.43. You can't like that, can you? You cannot like that. 4.43 for sunrise tomorrow. It's absolutely terrible. <laughs> I, I, I was up twice last week at 4. Uh, and and five hours, four or five hours of sleep is okay. Like for one night and then you can come back home and, and, and sleep. But if you do it for yeah a longer period... You just die. So yeah, don't don't do that. It it it's hard. It's hard. And luckily, I do have some forests fairly close to where I live, even though I live in a town, um, or city. But uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm not getting up at three to drive for an hour and to catch the sunrise. No, not at this time of year. No. <laughs> oh, it's horrendous. It is absolutely horrendous. Um, best yeah. place in Germany to shoot. What's your best place? What's your most favorite? That's from Bob Davis. I haven't been that much to Germany that's kind of on my to-do list um, I, so so Germany is huge we don't see a whole lot of landscape photography from Germany but it's yeah. a huge country so there must be something if I can find so many beautiful places in Denmark Germany must just be like even more so I really want to just do like you know the classics in Germany uh, many of the castles I'm really want to shoot those uh, and even though it's just like the most iconic places in uh, in germany i really want to do like a, a castle tour in germany uh, at some point <laughs> but uh, yeah uh, and obviously i think like if, if you're going for like landscapes the classic big epic stuff you have to go to southern germany and bavaria and down there <laughs> cool i love that i love that um yeah i used to live in germany you know i used to live in germany i was there for three years uh, mm. my pal Gary Beaumont has just said to me tell Gary he just set my phone off with his Siri <laughs> <laughs> right um, okay emails 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 uh, Mads I'm rattling through this as quick as I can my good friend my question <laughs> is for Mads well obviously uh, when he did the UK tour where was his favourite place and what was his favourite photo he took cheers Darren so when you were in the UK the last time where was your favorite place? Oh, that's such a... Mm. <sighs> this is win or lose I, I, now. You I, know that, I, don't I, I don't know. I, <laughs> I loved so many of those places. And also when it comes to the photos, it's like choosing between your children. Um, <laughs> I Yeah, but we all, we all have a favorite child, I don't say, we? <laughs> I would say the most efficient day that probably delivered one of my top three images was... Uh, the one in Glencoe when yeah. when I was walking up the uh, the mountain opposite the Buchel, yeah. uh, that 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 day was just amazing. Like it, it it had everything. It was one of the best photography experiences I've had, and I think the the shot I got of the Buchel was probably probably my favorite. But Gary, when we get to talk about the pictures here, I, I've chosen uh, two of them. I actually two of my favorites also from Britain. So. Yeah, it, uh, <laughs> it's 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 so hard to say. I, I I felt that I didn't. The Lake District is just absolutely ginormous, and I was only there for like 
three days. Sure. So, well, technically two days because it was just like a half a day in each end and then one full day. So, yeah. It's, and I absolutely love Snowdonia too, uh, and and Southern England. Even though it's not, I think it's it's not really known in the landscape photography community as a as a fantastic place to do landscape photography. But Southern England has so much to offer. Like, it's uh, the entire coastline is just ridiculous. You have so many historical sites. Your small quaint towns are just out of a fairy tale. It's it, Great Britain is just such a fantastic place for photography and yeah if if I could just choose one country to only photograph for the rest of my life I would probably choose Britain without <laughs> making my mouth too full yeah it is really nice I must admit um, I think my favorite image from last year was taken in Glencoe not mm. too many well not too far away from where you took your shot from as well purely coincidental that by the way but i did mm. i did remember seeing how passionate you were on that video when you were walking up that hill i can see the video now and you took that picture and you were super super passionate and that's as yeah. what i love about you it, and it's your a work. classic view like I, I think everybody has that shot it, 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 it's super iconic it, it's not like it's mm. original all you can do is just go up there and wait for the weather to be interesting and then take the shot but for little me coming from Denmark that has no <laughs> waterfalls, no mountains, no nothing, uh, standing there getting that shot where you just have like a cloud above the Buchel, even though you can see the entire thing and just have both of the uh, the valleys on either side being lit up uh, by rain with backlit sun. Sure. It was just, it was, yeah. <laughs> well, um, I've got one more question to ask um, from the email, and then we'll have a look at some of your pictures. Yes. So uh, from the email, this is from Med Venlig Hilson or something like that. Um, I would like to ask Mads, if he tried to take a picture of Great Belt as a long exposure, I tried, but I think that because of the wind, the bridge was not sharp. Do you know where that is, the Great Belt? Yeah, uh, okay. it's the largest uh, bridge we have in Denmark. It, uh, it It's the one between Sealand, where Copenhagen is, and then right. our middle island, right. uh, Funen. And uh, yeah, a huge, huge bridge. I was down there. I, I made a video from there like one a month, one and a half month-ish ago, uh, where I was down there to show how I make my epic selfies. And uh, no, I... Yeah, I did make some long exposures, but that was after that was after sunset, and that worked out fine for me. If if there is a lot of wind, I do think that there is a risk that yes, the uh, the, the bridge is so big that it will actually sway in the wind. So if you make like a long exposure of yeah, maybe probably beyond ten or fifteen seconds, cool. that the bridge can sway a little. Well, I'm glad I'm glad you knew exactly where that was because she also went on to say, "P.S. Me and my husband liked Mads's picture with the Raps Field. Is that Rape Field? Yeah, yeah Rape, rape Field. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Raps. She's written. That's <laughs> Rape. Mad. Yeah, that's that's the Danish word for it. <laughs> oh, is it? <laughs> yeah, Raps. It's it. I I was making so many uh, mistakes in in, in I, I call it Raps Fields in in English, and I don't know why. But yeah, Rape Seed Fields. All right, okay. right. Listen, it's quite funny actually because that brings that brings me onto something which I find highly amusing. I don't do selfies. I never do selfies. I'm not a selfie person. But watch, I took a selfie last week, and then I thought it was highly amusing because <laughs> I'm now looking at your pictures. I'm just going to very quickly flick through a few of your pictures that I've lifted from your Instagram account. By the way, you have to go and check out Madge's Instagram account. I'm sure most of you are here because you already know Madge anyway. But if you don't, if you've never been to his Instagram account, make sure you do because it's Damn spectacular. Oh, you scared me. Um, right, okay, look at this. Let's go webcam full screen. Hang on a sec, webcam and desktop. Let's go desktop full screen. Right, let me just show you what I mean. Let's just very quickly pop these up on here. Now, this is what happens if you look like Mads and you take selfies, right? I just want you to see the comparison. So this is just a few shots that I've just lifted. I'm gonna rattle through these pictures because there's so many of them, right? But look how cool that is. Mads, you'll just have to trust me on this because you're 30 seconds behind. But look how cool that is. I'm gonna run through, run through a few of these. That is super cool. That is awesome. That, oh, I was gonna ask you about that picture actually, by the way, and I was gonna ask you about that as well. Look at that for a selfie. Wow, that is just 
awesome that is awesome that is awesome i mean these pictures are just fantastic and these are only your selfies and i love that right now watch i mean look at that up there watch this right this is one that i took right last weekend look that's me <laughs> right Matt, you can't see this i'll hang on for like 20 seconds so nope. you can see it because when i do a selfie of me right i just look like some fat bloke in the picture <laughs> some old <laughs> some old fat bloke that's just oi get out of the picture you're ruining it <laughs> so that it, it does there, help to have been doing gymnastics for like 25 years <laughs> Well, yeah, just remember, I was your I was your size at your age. So, uh, yeah, so <laughs> I'm not saying any more than that. Yeah, but there is a bit of a difference between, uh, yeah, your selfie and my selfies. Right, okay, let's come back off that. Where are you? Okay, right. So, Matt, do me a favor, then I ask you to send me some pictures so we can have a quick look through some of your pictures that you sent me. Um, where are they? Okay, one second. So, let's... Uh, number one, let's bring up number one. Hang on a sec, Tony, don't say anything. Desktop, full screen, let's go split screen there, okay. So now I think if you oh, webcam and desktop, you should be able to see me and Mads while we have a look through some of these pictures. Number one, I believe that is the Lone Tree at Buttermere. Exactly, yeah. Do you know, I'm in the Lake District all the time, and I think I've only shot this once when I went past it once. I never actually have never been there to photograph this tree, but it's it's actually quite uninspiring when you first go there, isn't it? It's like a lot of lone trees. It's like, oh, is that it? <laughs> but they do photograph so well, don't they? Yeah, it, it, it's funny because looking at that tree, it, it it's a little bit like a excuse for itself it's it's really not a special tree <laughs> but but yeah the uh I, it, when, when i researched uh, england and the lake district uh, and the lake district photos that place kept popping up and i was like it's 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 pretty good like uh, it, it, it was the photos that i liked the most from there and the shot that i got there was something completely else because the first photos were like a, a little bit boring because it was, you know, there was a few showers here and there, and sure. and but but the sun like peeked through and and there wasn't really anything special about the light, and then suddenly from behind us we just got that cloud there, that insane uh, shower that that hit us, and I was just standing there and water. I had a little hole in my wellies, so there was water <laughs> seeping into my wellies. I, I I I had water seeping down my neck, and I was just like standing. I have to get this shot because I could see how the clouds would line up with the tree. So I was just like, yeah, standing there while uh, Sophie, my girlfriend, she was just like taking everything, the drone and everything, and just like trying to save it. <laughs> and yeah, I got the shot, and it's uh, it's. One so, of my top three photos from England. So look, let me just get this right. You're telling me that it was raining here in the UK. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> What's the chances, really? No. Yeah, yeah. Th th Who knew? <laughs> this just goes to show, it, it, it's like a counter-argument for so many people who moan about, oh, you shouldn't take this because everybody takes it and so on and so forth. And then exactly what you've just said then it's about the backstory you brought up this picture this could have been taken on your iphone at this point it makes no difference at the end mm. of the day it meant so much to you and you regaled such a good story that's attached to it and that is so yeah. important in photography it really is absolutely yeah. but of course it is a nice picture right yeah. let's have a look um at number two Yes. Number two, this is in Wales. Did you see any of the wild ponies when you were there, by the way? Uh, no, but it was the first time that we saw sheep with long tails. Oh, right. Okay. Are you sure they weren't that ponies? That was weird. Were, were they really big, nope. Mads? <laughs> <laughs> nope. Nope. So you've never seen sheep with long tails? I'm just trying to think. Not, not before that. No, you in, in Denmark all sheep have uh, has has short tails, and and even in uh, Iceland and the uh, yeah, and then the Faroes. Uh, I was there before England. Um, yeah, it's uh, for for some weird reasons. It was really really weird for us to see sheep with long tails. I bet lots of people are thinking wrong things there about 
sheep in Wales and especially me being Welsh and all the rest of it I'm saying no more than that that is a that is a lovely picture by the way captured that mood fantastically well and you never guess what it looks as if it was raining again Mads what's the chances <laughs> yeah what's the chance it's like we just had one shower after another coming in though it was only also the only day where we had a uh, thunder uh, a lightning we were actually on our way up and we were hit by a shower and a little bit further up there was a lightning strike so we were like uh should we go further up but then the shower went away and, and it was all fine like you can see in I managed to record myself in like super slow motion where the rain is just hammering down uh, in, in my vlog from there. And uh, yeah, I, I just really, I really, really, really love that scene. So I wanted to capture it somehow. And, and with the clouds and with that water in there, it was just, yeah. Again, it, it was one of those photos where you really struggled for it because you were just like super wet. But sure. I wouldn't have had any other kinds of light than I had there. And then with the post-processing I did, it's, it just came out. It's, again, one of my favorite photos. And it just, yeah, it, it I I'm not sure the English <laughs> word for that, but it's just the epitome of a landscape photo for me. It's quite an interesting walk up there as well because yeah. it's actually very slippery, isn't it, on the way back down? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I've been there quite a few times, actually. I think uh, my pal but, Gary went on his ass last time we were there, which was quite amusing. Yeah, that, 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 but that was the easy hike uh, we had in Snowdonia because the two other days before that and, and uh, afterwards, yeah. we went to uh, the glitters there in the background up behind there. That was hard. Okay. Fantastic picture. I love that. 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 Okay, so let's click on the next one. Um, I'm guessing you're not in Wales for this one. No. Number three, um, you're in some kind of ice cave. Look at the blue. Uh, actually, not. This is uh, this is the ice beach in okay. Iceland. Okay, an ice and, uh, bridge. It, no, it, it it's it's basically just a, a chunk of ice, which were more like a sheet of ice laying there on the beach, and uh, I crawled underneath it. It's not more than probably 70 centimeters or something like that tall so i had to cram my camera in there uh, close to the waves and try to make a long exposure try to keep uh, the guy there in the background still and yeah it was a really hard photo to get but it is one of those that few that stands out from the ice beach i think because a lot of people go there and a lot of people photograph that place um but yeah i, I really like it because it was a technically hard photo and I was just about to lose my camera, but luckily my, my, actually there, the big filters were a good idea because they protected the camera from the, all the water splashing up. Sure. Are you, are you on rocks there, Matt? So are you on rocks or are you on sand? Sand. Wow. So it's very difficult for uh, uh, long shutter speed shots as well with that water coming yeah, over the it's tripod legs. Probably a third of a second or something like that. Yeah. I think maybe a fourth, half a second. Yeah. Yeah, that is a brilliant, brilliant shot. I'm assuming, did you prime that guy to stand there? Was he with you or did you just chance it? He was with me, but right. uh, I didn't ask him to stand there. I, I caught him while he was standing there. Okay. That is a terrific. I've never, you know, I've never been to Iceland. That was one of my oh, plans. Oh, you should. Where, one of my plans for this year to go to Iceland. It really was. Um, yeah. It is amazing. There, there is a reason why it's so popular. If anybody's thinking about going to Iceland, by the way, um, if you want to know where the best places are to shoot, go on to Mads's website and have a look at his maps. And he's got all the maps there of all the places that he shoots. And you've got to pay a couple of pounds for it, and quite rightly so as well. But the money that that will save you in terms of time going around the island, because that's exactly what I would do, Mads. I'd go and grab that as well, mate, just to save all the time. That's a good idea, that, by the way. Thank you. Right. Um, is this is number four. Yes, number yes. four, Mads. Tell us about this one, my good friend. Yeah, so this is also from uh, the Highlands in Iceland. And... I, I have never seen this shot before, anything from there before. Uh, I was yeah, just driving around. You don't just drive around in, in the highlands of Iceland, but I was moving from one place <laughs> to another. And, and I came through this 
absolutely gorgeous area where it was just like long grassy plains mm -hmm. um and 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 then you had like also kind of were surrounded by mountains and they all had these gorgeous uh, while still being so green and not too aggressive mountains like very thin pointy peaks so i just took the drone up and flew around and and i found this place here from a distance and i flew over there and it was just so obvious to make this composition use that uh, green mossy thing coming out there from from the glacier river and then use that very yeah tormented landscape there in the background as a uh, yeah as, as the focal point for me it, it's uh, there's so much in many ways so much juxtaposition in it because it's still covered in green that kind of calms it down and then it has these gorges that I just really like a lot and I didn't know about this place and this composition I just found it by myself by flying around in there so it's uh, yeah it's uh, both lucky and and also like you know explore and you will find so without stating the obvious it's a it's a drone shot yes Again, yeah. which is what it's we a, was, it's a, what, we said what you would call a vertical panorama yeah yeah absolutely stunning and what I like about this is I'm constantly looking and looking and looking and seeing new things all the time and that is a terrific picture. If that's in Iceland, is that covered in snow now? Um, parts of it probably is. We are just in the end of May here. So I, I don't think the Highlands have opened up yet. Probably not for a couple of weeks. But uh, yeah, there, there would be snow most of the places there. Maybe down where the most green is, the, the, it is probably melted. Yeah, because it's like a, a dry riverbank, isn't it? With that yeah. green algae. I mean, what is that? What's that green? What is that? It's green? moss. Oh, it's moss. It? Oh. And yes, it really is that green. You don't believe your eyes until you're there. Wow. And what time of the year did you take that? That's in August. Wow. That is absolutely, yeah. that is a stunning picture. Thank um, you. I, I bet, really I like it too. I bet that did nothing on Instagram, did it? <laughs> How many thousands of hits has that got on Instagram? Quite, quite a few. It's not I my imagine. most popular, but it was really popular. Absolutely stunning. Let's go for the next one. Number five. Yes. Oh, Mads has been a little bit arty. That's a lovely, lovely shot. I like that of a lighthouse somewhere, I'm guessing. Yeah, it's in the, here in Denmark. And it was kind of the, the shot that proved to myself that I could make really, really high-class photos in Denmark. Mm -hmm. So th this lighthouse is fairly famous in Denmark. It's actually standing in a, a big dune in northern part of Jutland here. And I have come there quite a lot uh, as a kid. We usually go on summer vacation up there with my family. And to me, it's quite iconic. I think it's iconic for a lot of Danes. But uh, yeah, I wanted to get up there and photograph it during winter. And it was, we had like two or three days with snow that winter. That it, Not this winter, but the winter before. Sure. And it was only in that part of Denmark where we, they actually got some snow. And when I got up there, it's like, you could still see the sand and stuff. So I was looking for like a, a place where all the snow had collected. Mm -hmm. And then when the wind came and blew it all up, uh, I could get it there in the foreground. So even though it looks quite stormy and quite crazy, and you can see the video, it, it, it's not optimal uh, photography conditions in regard to, to wind and shake. But there weren't that much snow all over the place. It's only what I like, you know included within the frame so it looks a little bit different from what it actually looked like when you're just standing there because there weren't that much snow that is a, a terrific terrific picture now i don't do really tips videos but if i did and i tell everybody who comes to training with me everybody is the number one tip is don't be a lazy photographer because if you're a lazy photographer you'll never ever capture a shot like this what i'm saying is it's cold, it's raining, it's windy. Oh, it's too much snow. Look at that, because how many other people on this planet will have that same picture? Apart from you and I now. <laughs> <laughs> Good I didn't send you the original one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it'd be on the website for sale. 
Perfect. <laughs> if anybody wants to make me an offer, by the way, for the 72 DBI one, I'm happy still to sell it. No, no, that is a, that is a really, really good picture. But I just goes to show, you know, photography op opportunities present themselves in any conditions. And that is terrific. Well done, mate. Uh, the last Thank picture, you. number six. Oh, you do like your moody stuff, don't you? I do, yeah. I, I wanted to include something from the Faroe Islands mm -hmm. that uh, I haven't talked much about, but uh, this shot here, yeah, it's uh, I, f I found it while we were on a workshop. I kind of found this location, but we didn't have time to explore it and go up there because I hadn't been there before. So I went up there on, on my own in between a couple of workshops to, uh, to explore that place. Yeah. And it was just like... The, photographer's paradise because it had that pointy mountain there in the background and it just had so many waterfalls that you could use in the foreground it's quite formularic like you know find a foreground and stick a mountain in the background and then hope for some <laughs> good light to happen um but you know it's it it's it's unique nobody else have photographed that before as far as i know i have never seen photos from there before and even though Faroe islands are so small and a lot of people think that well, all the good shots have been taken. Um, I found that one, and yeah, yeah it, I, if you just again explore and go places where other people don't go, you might find something. I love that. Um, <laughs> what I really loved about this now is what I always get criticised for. Mads, can you tell me the name of that mountain? No. Right. What I absolutely love is what you just said and that pointy mountain in the background, because I, I say that on my videos because I don't really care the name of the mountain. And I always I always get people commenting, why don't you know the name of the mountain? I'm like, well, to me, it's just a pointy mountain in the background. <laughs> it's brilliant. <laughs> I love it when you just said that because I sounded just like me. Mads, that is another yeah. another terrific, terrific shot. Thank you. It, it, it's not an iconic mountain at all. It, it looks quite impressive as it stands there from this angle but you can't see it from down in in, in the settlement where you come in you need to go up there to see it point out right. like that <laughs> i've not been to the faroe islands either again that was part of my uh, madcap plans for this year and some of my, yeah. mad, my some of my madcap plans for this year which i was really looking forward to and i am going to do it as soon as uh, it opens back up in europe is um I've got this mad cat crazy idea and hopefully it works. We're quite literally, I'm just going to pin a tail on the donkey. I've, I'm going to have a rough idea of where I want to go. But I'm just going to head to somewhere like in the Swiss Alps. But then the videos will be the journey from here to there. But I'm not mm. going to do any uh, research. I'm just literally going to drive. And then where I feel like stopping, I'm just going to stop. And I think that would be a cool thing to do. That sounds like a great idea. I remember when I was in the Alps and we had a very tight schedule. We yep. were dro driving past so many places that could work really, really well for some original, beautiful photography. Yep. But because we had like set our minds to all these iconic locations, we were just following that plan. So we didn't really have any buffer time where we could just stop sure. over and say, okay, tonight we will shoot this place. Uh, but there are so many options down there. You hardly have to plan anything. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. If I was going to somewhere like Iceland, the first thing I'd be doing now, which hopefully you guys will do as well, get yourself on Mads' website. Ser this is serious, by the way. He's not asked me to plug this, but I was looking, doing my research on Mads. Not that I needed to, but obviously I just want to make sure I know the man uh, inside and out. And he, he actually sells, not, not for a great deal of money, um, and quite rightly so as well, but all the locations. So if you are going to go to Iceland, or go to the, do you sell them for the Faroe Islands as well, Mads? Yeah. Okay, then honestly, it's just, can you imagine downloading Google Maps with all of the points where Mads has been and photographed? And you could even see the photographs he's taken from there. And I'm not suggesting you do that just to copy Mads, but why not? Why not go for, copy Mads? It, it, it's great for inspiration. Like when I mm. went to Iceland myself, I was following like a PDF from a local photographer up there. And that was the only thing I could find on different photography locations in Iceland. And of course, try to put your own spin on it. Like <clears throat> it is what it is. You want to go to the iconic locations for the cultural reasons. It is. And it's just amazing to look at. Um, yeah. So, of course, do that. It is what it is. Right, man. So let me very quickly, just before I finish with you, sir, if I can, I'm going to just very quickly rattle through some other questions that have come through so you can answer them uh, in a short fashion, if you will. Um, Bring it. Okay, Dharma Photofilm. This is from him. Question, are you using medium format cameras? I think we've no. answered that. Um, any plans to? Again, no reason, is there? 
as a landscape photographer? No, no, not not really, no. When take okay, la, 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 la. this is from I can't fly one thousand and one. I'm sure he asked a question earlier on. When taking a photo, are you thinking ahead to what it will look like in print? Question. Got Gary and Mads, please. For right. the most part, I have a pretty good idea about the potential of what I'm catching. Yes. Exploring light. Ever got the urge to shoot cityscapes? I, I did for a while, yes. Uh, I did that uh, time-blending stuff that Eli Lucardi did for a long time, uh, or he's known for. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I only have 24 hours a day. Uh, but, yeah, I, I, I have been shooting uh, cityscapes. You can actually go to my homepage and look in my Danish uh, portfolio collection. If you go all the way down, there should be some cityscape photos there. Cool. What about um, street photography? Does that interest you at all, street photography? Absolutely not, no. <laughs> I tried it one day and it was, uh, t yeah, no. Just just no, no, no. Just no, 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 no. God, I think, I think, I think we've done it all. Well. I think we've got it all. I've got, I've got, I've got way more. Do you know what? This has just literally been the questions that's uh, that's come to me from the viewers. I've got so many questions written down on here. I've not... I've not even touched them, but I won't hold you back anymore. Um, yeah, there's loads of questions on there. There's going to be some fun stuff as well. Can I ask you some fun stuff before I get rid of you? Yeah, yeah, sure. I know I've already paid you for an hour, but let's have a look. <laughs> Nick Page is on here now. He'll be thinking, hang on a minute, he didn't pay me a penny. Yes, I paid Mads for an hour. <laughs> um, I wish. I was going to ask you some question. Uh, Bring it. Okay. Um, who have, who have, boring question, then we'll, we'll do a bit of fun stuff. Um, who are your vlogging influencers? Um, vlogging influencers? Uh, that, that, that would be like, you know, Thomas Eaton, Nigel Danson, um, Adam Gibbs, Simon Baxter, uh, all those things like I, I actually started out myself in videography doing video editing yeah. before I went to photography yeah. so a lot of my style is developed from my interest for blockbuster movie trailers so that's why they might have that epic thing to it first sure. and foremost sure. and why you kind of like you know you, you build up towards a climax so that's yeah it's cr quite basic storytelling, but yeah. Yeah. Can you see the live feed? Obviously, only you and I can see the live feed. Nobody else can see the live feed. Can you see the live feed or not? You can't see the live no. feed. Okay, right. I was just holding it. I was holding a placard up that's got my name on it. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Thanks for mentioning everybody but me. No, I'm just joking. Oh. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. <laughs> um, quick fire questions. Let's throw some quick fire questions. Let's just have a bit of fun. One minute and then we'll say uh, good night to you. Quick question, photography-wise then. Where would you prefer to go and photograph? North Pole or Sahara Desert? Where would you prefer? Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> Sahara, I think. Is that because it's warmer? Yeah, and I think there's a little bit more opportunities for getting something special, something you... I don't know. It's <laughs> that, That's hard. Yeah, the, the inner, <laughs> the inner Mads Peter Iverson. Would you yeah. want to be Tarzan or James Bond? Bear in mind, your girlfriend could be listening. <laughs> Come on, um, you said it's a bit of fun. We've got you laughing. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. James Bond. <laughs> it's easy just to say you want to move on. Have you got any superstitions? I've never asked anybody that question in my life. And I didn't want to ask at the beginning in case you did have. I, I, I would say absolutely not, no. Uh, part of my philosophy stuff was to like get the answers to all the religion science stuff. So I would say no. The worst thing to forget on a trip, the worst thing, the worst thing to forget on a trip, if you went on a trip and you forgot one thing, what would the worst thing be? The Don't battery camera. for my camera. <laughs> yeah, well, I can imagine that. I've done that, you know. I have done that quite literally when the the camera's flashing you know, almost empty and you're thinking, oh, no. Yeah. Uh, what's your worst purchase? Your worst purchase? Um, for now, I think it is 
probably my uh, my uh, I upturned Star Trekker. Tony, <laughs> sorry what? <laughs> <laughs> my, my Star Trekker. I haven't used it yet. I bought it a year ago. Oh my god. Oh, the cool things as well. I, I follow lots of uh, stargazers, and uh, yeah, I do like that sort of thing. Where is your career? Where's Mads Peter Iverson going to be in ten years from now? I proud myself of not knowing. Good answer. Book, 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 book. Where is your book, Mister Iverson? I really want to make a book, uh, but I I have my ebooks. But uh, no, uh, a physical book is a project uh, that is beyond. Now, right now, I'm working on a, a big uh, Photoshop tutorial uh, bundle, uh, Photoshop for landscape photographers. And on the other side of that, I've planned another ebook. And on the other side of that, we can maybe start talking about a physical book. Cool. Yes. Um, yes. I found. Yeah. Okay. I'll say no more about that. What would your what would your worst and best photography job be, Mister Mads Peter Iverson? What what would the worst if I if I employed you now as a photographer? What was what what would be the worst job I could give you? Um, that would be some kind of like. I don't know if you have the expression in English, but slave work, where you just have to sit and repeat the same thing again and again and again and again. Uh, very not creative stuff. And the best... Like, like commercial photography? Like commercial photography, would you say? Tins of beans front, tin of beans back, tin of beans top, tin of beans bottom. That sort of thing? Like product y photography? Yeah, yeah. Like if, if we specifically talk about photography genre, I... I... I would almost say wedding photography. I've tried it a few times and I honestly don't like it. Uh, but but very repetitive stuff, I, I would say, is probably worse. Is, yeah. is Mads a people person? I would say so, yes. Okay. Okay. What's your best job? My best job? The one I already got. <laughs> that is a fantastic answer. Um, right. Okay. I asked Nick... Right, I'm enjoying this. I asked Nick. I like watching you cringe. I asked Nick a few quick fire questions, right? Let's go back to them. Are you ready for this? Yeah. Right, and then we'll finish. I promise you. I'm going to ask you the same questions because I made a note of them. Uh, black and white or color? Color. Landscape or seascape? Uh, <laughs> landscape. Batman or Superman? Batman. Rock star or film star? Film star. Rich or popular? Or popular. So rich or popular? Uh, popular. Star Wars and Star Trek? <sighs> Since the last trilogy of Star Wars, I would say Star Trek. If you weren't born where you were born, this is the last question. Where would you have preferred to have been born? Norway. Be a Norwegian. That's a harder yeah. language than the language you speak now, isn't it? That's a hard language to learn. No. <laughs> Not when you're super Norwegian, intelligent like you. Well, when you compare the Scandinavian languages, uh, Norwegian and, and Finnish are those that are written language are closest to how they actually speak it. Oh, right. okay. Danish is terrible. Um, it, it's not logical. In Norwegian... What they say is how it's pronounced. It makes sense. When when I look at a word in Norwegian, it makes sense if it was written like that in Danish. Cool. Well, Mads, I can't thank you enough for being here. I've taken up a lot of your time because look at that. It's one hour and 42 minutes. And you wow. said, what would it be like? 30 minutes, half an hour or something. So uh, you've tops been, an hour. <laughs> you, you've, yeah, tops an hour. That's it. I'm off. Uh, you've been a great sport and a lovely, lovely interviewee. So thank you very much indeed. And everybody else out there, I know you already will know of Mads. If you don't, you know what to do. Down below, I've left all of Mads's socials. Please go and check out. Well, just go and check out them all for heaven's sake. Okay. Um, <laughs> Mads, thank you very much indeed. 
Thanks for being here. Thank you, here. Gary. It has it has been an absolute pleasure. It has been so funny. Good um, good questions uh, also from people on, on YouTube. Uh, deep questions, not always uh, the same stuff. It's uh, really nice. I, I enjoyed it. Yeah, they're much more exciting than the questions I probably had to ask you. <laughs> so thanks to everybody for making this interview complete. Thank you very much indeed. Mads, hopefully one day our paths will cross. And next time, Let's hope for it. Next time we're in the UK, give us a buzz and uh, maybe we'll go out and have a shoot together. Absolutely. All right, mate. Listen, you All take right. care. You take care, my friend. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, Gary. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye-bye, mate. Bye-bye. I'm going to cut you off now. One second. Hang on. Yeah. If I can find you. One second. Right, Madge. Cheers, mate. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye. Right. Right. For some unknown reason, when I cut off... Wasn't Mads good? When I cut... I think... Let's just check that. Uh, Tony, do me a favor, just check to make sure that volume is fine. When I get rid of, um, or when I switch Skype off for some other reason, I mentioned it last week, my audio goes absolutely nuts. It goes mental. So let's just check that and let's pop that on there. So now, whew, you've just got me. Um, let's say hi to a few people. Okay, fine. I've sussed the audio out now. That's really good. Um, Sandy, got to the party a bit late. Doesn't matter. I'll leave it on anyway. Another fantastic evening. And thanks to Mads and, of course, to Gary. You're welcome. I'm just reading some of the interviews. Uh, good call, John. Thumbs up, people. Again, awesome. You, yeah, okay. You guys are chatting with each other. Not really sure what that's all about. Right, listen. Um, yeah. Such a nice, such a nice, nice, nice man. He really, really is. And I, I, I do like that. And I made this sincerely when I mentioned earlier on about how his channel is growing. His channel is growing naturally. And I do like that. Nothing is forced about his channel. Because honestly, you know, if you just look around the world of YouTube, you will see that um, lots of people forcibly make videos. Perhaps they're not qualified to make because obviously if it's very clickbaity anyway i've got to be careful because it sounds like sour grapes when you mention it i don't really want to but uh it yeah it does annoy me a bit anyway there you go right um going back to my script i have got the best of facebook and i'm going to critique your pictures as well but once again it's an hour and 45 minutes and it's dragged on a bit so not dragged on no that's wrong of me to say dragged on a bit absolutely far from dragged on i could have carried on talking to mads all night long because he's such a, a lovely man um listen i've got a couple of things that i want to mention um first of all look a new vlogging camera I bought a new vlogging camera i've got new vlogging gear new microphone um i've got all sorts um yeah so i want to improve my um, my video watches are down at the moment, so I've got new gear and I'm going to just change the way I vlog ever so slightly. Um, yeah, it's really, really annoying, but anyway. Right, so what I was gonna say, right, these Sunday nights, I can't continue doing the live interviews on a Sunday night. I've made a conscious decision and I messaged uh, everybody who is a member of my YouTube, um, basically explaining to them throughout the week what my intentions were. I love this. I absolutely love the interview process. I love networking and meeting other people. The problem I've got with it is it takes me two days to do this, plus the length of time it takes to actually film this. Again, I don't have any issue with that, except there's an awful lot of work involved with that when there's not many people that actually watch the videos, relatively speaking. You guys are all here now, and I love you all for being here now, so thank you very much indeed. So my gripe isn't with you guys. My gripe is with YouTube, because YouTube doesn't promote live um, broadcasts. It doesn't promote live interviews, which is a real shame, actually. But I've made a conscious decision. I'm not going to stop doing the live interviews, but I'm literally going to do perhaps one a month, I've decided now, because there's too much work that goes into it for very, very little gain. I mean, the length of time it's taken me to put this on for tonight, which has been lovely because I've met somebody I've never met before, 
But I could have made two vlogs in that time and I could have made two vlogs that would have received, you know, four or five times the amount of views that this video uh, has reached. So it's with a heavy heart that unfortunately I am going to have to give up these Sunday nights, but I'll just put more effort into the one a month that I'll do. Um, so just follow me on Facebook if you don't already, and I will explain to you when they're going to be. But I'm going to do one more and I'm going to do it on Wednesday. And I've got a really, really, really nice guest coming in on Wednesday. And in, it's not somebody that you guys will know and it's not somebody that I've ever met. It's actually somebody from the Facebook group, somebody whose work I admire. And I reached out to him and asked if he'd come on here on my show on Wednesday so that I can interview him. And he said, yes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to wish you all a farewell for tonight and thank you for being here. I'm going to carry over the best of Facebook and all the critiquing that you guys have sent me. You guys have sent me loads of pictures because I don't want to do it now. Otherwise, I feel as if I'm rushing them. So Wednesday will be my last one before it then goes to one a month. That's what I've decided I'm going to do one a month. But please, if you can, join me on Wednesday because what's really good about the photographer who is my guest on Wednesday is that he isn't a superstar on YouTube. He is just genuinely a very good photographer. And that also was what this show was all about. So I'm looking forward to having a chat with him on Wednesday night. So it'll be Wednesday night, six o'clock, live with a guest photographer. I'm not gonna tell you who it is. It doesn't matter, you probably won't know him anyway. But come and join myself and my guest photographer, Jack, say no more than that, uh, on, on Wednesday. And then we'll also go through the best of Facebook, which is absolutely fantastic. And I'll also critique your pictures so that I don't have to rush them. Um, if you want to send me some pictures to critique, I can do that on Wednesday for you. The usual address, gary at garygoff.co.uk and not Grey Goff that I put down with my speed typing during the week. So that's it. Thank you everybody out there for joining me tonight. Where's my live stream? Wednesday in my calendar. I'll be there, Gary. Build up a small f uh, family on here. Yes, I know, Tony. I know, I'm really sorry, by the way, but if you look at my viewing figures, I'm also, I just believe that me doing the interviews and me spending so much time on the live interviews when they're not being watched is actually affecting my YouTube views as well. Um, I put a video out last night, by the way, called The Ghost Tree. Do me a favor, go and watch that if you haven't. Just go and watch it. Even if you don't look at it, put it on and let it run through, please. Right, guys, thank you very much indeed for joining me tonight. And of course, thank you very much indeed for the superstar that is Mads Peter Iverson. You guys take care. I will see you on Wednesday. And Tony, and uh, well, Tony especially, thank you for all of your help tonight, mate, and over the past few weeks. Guys, have yourself a good one. I'll see you on Wednesday. Good night.